Okay, 30 seconds into this hangout, and I'm already stunlocked. Kaya's talking to a bird. Oh, you mean the birds that chirp in Morse code? Huh. Kinda like how the Ruin Guards from Conria have a message in Morse code? Oh, and it's not like I've compared the King of Conria Airmen to IRL Norse Odin, and have talked extensively about Odin and his bird spies that watch the world for him. Is Kaya an informant for Conria or something? What is this, a bird spy? Are we bird spying right now? <sighs> okay, I'm getting way ahead of myself. In patch 3.8, we got a lot of theater. Kaya performs two different roles in two different plays. In the Valeria Mirage event, he's the Dagger Bandit, looking for light for a kingdom shrouded in darkness. In the Hangout event, he's a prince seeking peace between two nations at war, and is in conflict with his fanatical warmonger Father King. These plays have multiple layers of meaning in how they relate to Kaya. In the former, there seems to be a few historical stories taped together, and in the latter, there's clearly something more personal to Kaya's internal conflict. But most importantly, there's this bigger overarching theme of fate as a script for the theater of life. All the world's a stage and all the people merely actors. Anyway, let's break down these plays a bit. The play in the Valerian Mirage seems to largely reflect how Idea came across the bottle and bottle land. Simply put, a fiery mage, Alice, gifted it to her after Idea fled Fontaine following the Cataclysm. But the Dagger Bandit seems to reflect another story combined with this plot. Paimon notes that the ending doesn't make any sense and Idea didn't leave with the Dagger Bandit, so I think it's likely that the entire encounter was Zosimos' creative liberty at work. In terms of what the Dagger Bandit story means, an obvious interpretation is that it could very metaphorically represent Conria and their pursuit of some sort of power, or whatever the light represents, to bolster or save the kingdom. I mean, we do know of at least one story of a Conrian finding something powerful that was dropped from the sky. And also, the musical track that plays during this scene is called Towers of Afrasiab, and the door to Conria is located in the subregion called Hange Afrasiab. So, at the very least, it seems to be something Conria adjacent. But, to go off on a tangent to speculate a little bit, Kaya's costume, Sailwind Shadow, is from the play. He's the Dagger Bandit, but from the splash art, you can clearly see he's a pirate. If you've seen my videos before, you know that Kaya had a cool, sexy pirate grandpa, who he got his eye patch from, and who I can't shut up about. And, this pirate grandpa is actually the same Conrian I mentioned who found something that fell from the sky. So, Bear with me with this next part, because it's a lot of crack theory. In Kaya's story, Grandpa found a powerful magical sword that was dropped by Celestia into the sea. I've speculated before that this magical sword was actually a celestial nail, and I've even further speculated that Grandpa was seeking the power of the celestial nail to rid Conria of dark abyssal power. Would it be a stretch, then, to imagine that the Dagger Bandit story was taking some plot points from Pirate Grandpa? Yeah, probably. But I also can't stop thinking about something weird we learned long ago in the Chasm. The Wish Granter, a floating stone that emitted a faint light, was said to be able to grant wishes, but would cause miners to hallucinate. And this is the entire reason the Chasm closed in the first place. The Wish Granter, as it turns out, is a celestial nail or its fragments. So, glowing wish-granting rock, glowing wish-granting bottle, it's like basically the same. In the same way that a hot dog is a sandwich. Anyway, this is probably just me stringing together the most minor connections and it's completely wrong, but I can't hear the criticism through the tinfoil hat covering my ears. But on a serious note, the story could much more simply be foreshadowing Kaya as Conria's last hope. Okay, anyway, going back to the actual topic of this video, but still on Kaya's costume. The outfit description is a conversation between Kaya and Klee, but the conversation may be revealing some of Kaya's inner thoughts about the roles we all play, and specifically for him, a knight versus a bandit. In the dichotomy of knights versus bandits, 
The defining difference is the rules they follow. A thief will not bear the blade of a knight, and a traditional knight will not sneak out a hidden dagger to hurt someone. I find the purposeful use of traditional here interesting, because while Kaya is an excellent knight and superb at his job, his methods are undoubtedly unconventional. So I wonder if this is trying to say something about where Kaya would fit in this dichotomy. Kaya did say to Kale that he's okay with his role as a bandit because he steals from the bad guys, making him the good guy. And the description of the outfit also paints the dagger bandit as a virtuous and charitable thief. So, this all seems to be a bit of an allegory. We know from his character stories that he has an internal conflict of being an agent planted by Conria and also being a child of Mondstadt. He's wondered whether if, when confronted, he would side with his birth father who abandoned him or with his adoptive father who loved and raised him. I think the knight here would represent Mondstadt, a peaceful land known for the Knights of Favonius. So the bandit would be Conria. Now remember, bandits and pirates steal and rob. And I've talked about this before, but this seems to be yet another reference to Daring Disney Balloon, which inspires a great deal of Conria lore. In Richard Wagner's opera, the dwarf Alberic, a Nibelung, steals the Rhine gold from the Rhine maidens and forges a ring of power. The entire opera revolves around the conflict of everyone trying to obtain the stolen ring. So Alberic, both in the opera and this play, are bandits. Going back to some big picture stuff. The description later says, if the characters in the story don't abide by the rules, the same rules that distinguish bandits from knights, then the story has betrayed the roles dictated by fate. To me, this last part is really getting at the idea that fate itself is just theater. And this all certainly puts Kaya's second constellation, called Never Ending Performance, in a new light. But this is getting at something even deeper that's explored in The Hangout. If you don't follow the rules, you betray the roles dictated by fate. And as such, you defy fate itself. We learn a lot of things about Kaya from The Hangout. For example, as a child, Kaya was much more meager, while Diluc was the rambunctious one. And we also learn that Kaya has always been a very kind person, but reluctant to be acknowledged for it. But the main thing we really see is how much the people of Mondstadt care for and love Kaya, and how Kaya cares for and loves them. I can't even exaggerate how much of a prevalent theme this is. Even with the animal Archon himself, the poem Venti gifts to Kaya is about a boat in treacherous waters escaping the Dome of Night into safe harbor. He's basically reaffirming, in language that Kaya can understand, that he is welcome and free and home in Mondstadt. Oh, we also learn that he's really good at putting on an act, and also he has a lucky coin that he can apparently control by telling it jokes. I think he was teasing us about that, but I choose to believe it's 100% canon he can control a coin with his mind. And then there's the play. To summarize, there are two nations in conflict, where the son wants peace between the nations, but the king, Kabus, wants bloodshed and total devastation. The prince, Kubad, will face grave consequences if he returns home, and laments his tragic fate of never being able to return home. When you ask Kaya about this story, you can ask if it left an impression on him, and he replies, saying he resonates with a cruel truth. The circumstances of your birth define your choices for the rest of your life. So it's once again really, really leaning into his internal conflict of birthland versus homeland. Not to mention, this is like the exact same spot where Kaya and Dane have a conversation about Albrecht, the founder of the Abyss Order, and Dane's like, hey, don't do that. And Paimon is like, Kaya, you would never do that, right? And Kaya is like, haha, and gives a non-answer. Anyway, similar to how knights and bandits play these roles and how they could signify something else, we can think about the roles in this play and who and what they might signify. The quest description says that drama is the essence of reality. 
The play is not merely a one-to-one -one allegory for Conria and Mondstadt, or even Conria or Celestia, but a distillation of themes and archetypes. There's a corrupted, fanatical king, perhaps like King Airman, and the play making a point that even one survivor will seek revenge for atrocities, like Clotar forming the Abyss Order. And then there's the Prince Kubad. He wants peace, but his father does not. And if he goes home, he will have to face the wrath of his father. And this is the role that Kaya relates to. I mean, he literally tells you that it made an impression on him because he related to this truth about birth circumstances. So perhaps this is also giving us new insight into Kaya's conflict. It's not just about loyalty. It's about dreading the consequences of a decision. It's also hinted that Kaya knows exactly how things will pan out when he's inevitably at that crossroads that Mona foresees. When you read Kaya's thoughts using Nahida, he laments already knowing the story script. He is talking about the play, but I certainly wouldn't be surprised if there's a double meaning here. During the play, Kaya stalls during a scene, seemingly forgetting the next line. To be clear though, Kaya didn't forget his lines. He hesitates as if reminded of something, and then he goes off script. Must it be so? Then addressing the audience. Do you believe in fate? If you knew you had a tragic fate, what would you do? He throws the intaglio to the traveler who cheers him on to challenge fate. Kaya responds. Then so must it be, yes, so must it be. I shall not bow to the will of fate. I am no pawn in heaven's plan. Kaya eventually puts the play back on course with a variation of Darbel's original line. Aside from improvising, there is one major change. Instead of saying that fate designed for him to die in a foreign land, he chooses to. So perhaps this is his own feelings about Mondstadt showing. Unlike Prince Kubad, he's not resigned to circumstance. He's choosing to reject the role given to him by his father and to live his own life freely. After the play, you can read his thoughts, and he's still thinking, So must it be. Yes, so must it be. The caption for the ending for questions reads these same lines. So must it be. Yes, so must it be. It's a progress marker. It's a storyline summary. The fact he's still thinking about this and it's repeated so much shows the grave significance of the words. Kaya is dedicated to choosing his own destiny. I was so struck by this sequence, just in general, but there's another thing that really stands out to me. Earlier, Kaya explains that it's a tale with classical flavor. History repeats itself, and if you look to the past, you can always figure out the unfathomable of the present. And in the play, he questions fate. Taken together, this heavily reminded me of something I've previously explored in a video on flowers for Princess Fischl and how it may have connections with Conria. It's regarding the existential philosopher Nietzsche and the concept of eternal return. To summarize, eternal return is the idea that time is infinite, but there's a finite number of events that can occur, so history would eventually repeat itself. Nietzsche's focus was not on if this was true or not, but instead asked, what is the burden of the question on us? If you knew things eternally recurred, would you be delighted? Having an amor fati, or love of fate? Or would you be horrified, and resistant, and defiant? So this theme of defying fate, still yet, goes a little deeper. At the conclusion of the hangout, Kaya monologues about fate and scripts, and he uses some very choice language. To summarize what he says, perhaps there's an inept god deciding fate, similar to an author writing scripts. All the world's a stage, and all the people merely players. And actors need to wake up and realize they don't need to follow the script, and they should feel free to improvise. Uh, he does follow up with a haha, don't take me too literally, but sure, Jan. But this all mirrors something we learned about bandits and knights. Characters in a story play roles, and they must follow rules. If they do not follow the rules, 
then the story has betrayed the roles dictated by fate. So here's what's eating away at me. And as a disclaimer, this is just one interpretation I'm going to delve into, and it may not be right. But, two things. One, Nicole of the Hexen Circle told us at the end of the Sumeru interlude that fate is difficult to change. Second, the Kari Bear quest talks a lot about changing fate. The Sinner talks about transcending and rising above your bestowed fate. And Clotar laments Kari Bear's fate, but rejoices that with the power of the Sinner, Kari Bear can weave his destiny anew. So instead of resigning to the fate of the curse, it's flipping the script. Basically, what I'm getting at is this. It seems ironic that Kaya, in his pursuit to escape his duty, given to him by his father and Conrian lineage, may be subscribing to the same core essence of defying fate that Clotar did. Hear me out. The second part of the Kari Bear quest, where you meet Clotar Alberic, is called Fortune Mocking Pedigree. Pedigree meaning ancestry here. So a family line that laughs at fate. Hearing Kaya Alberic say that he shall not bow to the will of fate, even if it's just in a play, makes this quest title a little more poignant. There is yet another suspicious element here, and I may be overanalyzing, but I think it's worth discussing. After talking about the inept god deciding fate, Kaya clarifies that inept is a good word, but perhaps it is too civil of a word. I think this is a rare glimpse into Kaya letting down his guard and letting his true feelings show just a little bit. I wonder, then, what word would Kaya really like to use? Incompetent? He does say, This god turns fathers against sons and are bent on flaming the fires of war. So perhaps Kaya would also like to imply that they are not just inadequate, they are intentional in their malice. So maybe despicable? cruel, or even vile. You can see what I'm getting at here with the classic Connerian distaste for the gods. Now, I know that Kaya is cool with Venti, and I also want to make it clear that I don't think Kaya will join the Abyss Order. But I personally don't think it's as simple as Kaya choosing sides. Because choosing a side means following the script. Mona read his fate that says as such. So I think Kaya wants to deviate from the roles and improvise, and this means defying fate. As for what exactly this might look like in the future, your guess is as good as mine. Comment below with your thoughts. Okay, before I go, as a fun bonus fact I couldn't fit anywhere else, I noticed that the musical sting that plays during his outfit reveal in both The Hangout and The Valerium Mirage is from, like, one other scene in the game? It's called Glowing Embers on Shimmering Voyage Volume 3, and it's the same music that plays when we meet the dragon of Pep. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything else beyond reusing music out of convenience, but hear me out. Thank you for watching my video. Please like and subscribe, turn that notification bell on, and tell all your friends about me. Do comment with your own theories, I love reading them, even if I can't get around to responding to everyone. I co-host a Genshin stream on twitch.tv slash owletdesu. It's not for kids. I recently started a new job, so I've been slow with videos and streaming, but I'm gearing up for the tsunami of lore with Fontaine. I'm excited to see where the story goes. Thanks again. Okay, bye.